Hi, I'm Rachel, and today I'm asking the question, what is the matter with me? Do I have art ADHD, or is it FOMO? And what does this have to do with finding my art business niche? Creatives like us have such a difficult time finding our art niche. I mean, look around you. In case you haven't noticed, this world is an incredibly inspiring place. I mean, we artists could make art based on just about anything that we see. The pine cones on the ground, the mushrooms, the leaves, the grass, the trees, the birds, the clouds in the sky. And then there's man-made things like architecture and sofas and chairs and home decor items and transportation things like cars, trains, and planes. And the list is endless. We creatives sometimes think that creativity is limited to the fine arts, such as music and writing and the 2D and 3D arts like drawing, painting, and such like that. But actually creativity is found in all the disciplines such as medicine, math, science, history. Creativity is just problem solving, using those brilliant ideas you have inside to solve the world's problems and make it a better place to be. But for the purpose of today's video, I'm going to be talking just about the 2D and 3D visual arts, things like drawing and painting, sculpting, making fiber arts and ceramics and things like that. I've been thinking, when it comes to finding your art niche, there are several different types of artists in this world. We all know who they are. The first kind are the kind that dive in. They jump headfirst into the pool. They try all kinds of art things and very quickly figure out what it is that they want to do and they seem to succeed very, very quickly. And the next type are those who have always known what they want to do ever since they were probably a baby in their crib. They have said, I'm going to be a painter and their cute little Instagram feeds have cute little squares of that gallery art painting and it's just so sweet and beautiful and they've never doubted themselves and they've never wanted to try anything else. That's not me. And the third type of people are the dabblers. Those are the ones that maybe are just getting started in art and they need to try out all those different things that are out there. They try things out, but they don't always stick to them and thus they have lots of unfinished projects lying about their house. And they often fall victim to imposter syndrome. They feel that they're not a real artist and they won't be a real artist until somebody validates them or, or somebody pays for their art. The next type of artist is the super genius type, you know, the Michelangelo's, the Da Vinci's, the kind of people who whatever they make, it's astounding, it's amazing, it's extraordinary. They're the kind of people that we find and we scroll and we find on Instagram and we look at and we're like, I can't believe they made this, like they have the golden touch or something. And then there's people like you and me who get so excited and we wanted to try out all those new art trends. If it's digital, we're gonna go digital. If it's creating mugs, we're gonna do mugs. If it's opening up a sticker shop, we've gotta open a sticker shop. If it's going to be writing out lyrics and doing art based off the music, we're gonna do that. If it's selling digital art prints, we're gonna do that. We have what's called shiny object syndrome and anything that flashes before our face, we jump onto it and be like, yes, can we please try it? We're so excited. But is that really helpful? So I was thinking about all these things and thinking about how much it parallels ADHD. So. I came up with the phrase art ADHD. Now I googled it and there is no such thing as art ADHD, so this is a little bit of stretch of imagination. So I was wondering if explaining this would help people like you and me to figure out our art niche if we understand what we're dealing with. Let's go to the definition that I pulled off of a medical website. So ADHD has three main traits. The first one is inattention, a short attention span or difficulty listening. Number two is impulsivity often interrupts others. Number three, hyperactivity. Seems to be in constant motion. Runs around with no apparent goal except motion. Hmm. So if we relate that to art, what does that look like? So inattentiveness. The main signs of that are having a short attention span, being easily distracted. Hmm. How many times do you check your email or scroll through social media when you should be creating? Or do you hop up from your desk and decide that you need to go look in the fridge and get a snack? Maybe you make yourself a cup of tea or hot chocolate. Maybe you look out the window, decide it's time to take your dog for a walk or let the cat out the back door. Or maybe you need to call a friend. No, we're not distracted, are we? Maybe you procrastinate a lot. You are thinking of everything else that you could be doing besides creating that art. Another sign of inattentiveness is making careless mistakes. How many times did you have to start over with that painting because 
you were not careful and you dragged your hand through the very first blob of paint that you put on there. An another sign of appearing forgetful or losing things. Have you organized your art studio lately? I did and it made a world of difference. Uh, another sign is appearing to be unable to listen or carry on instructions. How many of you have actually read the instructions on any of your art supplies? Why? Oil paint? Like, how do you clean those brushes? I actually have brushes that are still standing in some oil thinking that that could solve the problem because I didn't clean them properly. Um, how many of you are constantly changing your activities or tasks or having difficulty organizing tasks? Okay, in the hyperactivity and impulsiveness category, the main signs are being unable to sit still. We already talked about that, hopping up and down from your desk, constantly fidgeting, being unable to concentrate on the tasks. How many of you try to multitask, listen to a bunch of stuff like podcasts, music while you're working? It, sometimes it helps you, sometimes it doesn't help. You gotta know when to put it on, when to turn it off. How many of you have excessive talking? How many of you act without thinking? Wow, and then you wish you had not put those marks on the paper because you really weren't thinking, because you really weren't thinking. And then um, a little or no sense of danger. So I've come up with my explanation of what I think art ADHD is. Perhaps you try a new art medium and you get really excited, you buy all these new art supplies and you try it out and you don't like it and you immediately dismiss it as something you will never ever touch again. In fact, you hate it. But maybe it's just because you didn't learn first how to use that medium. Maybe you don't understand the right way to use it or the right way to apply it. Or perhaps maybe you don't like the strokes it makes because they don't line with you. Like some people like really straight lines or they like um, soft lines. Some people like fuzzy lines and other people they hate fuzzy lines. So perhaps you need to study the medium a little bit and figure out whether or not that helps you. Under impulsivity, do you start too many projects all at the same time, thinking that you can accomplish them all and telling people yes way too many times? Art ADHD, maybe you set up multiple Instagram accounts thinking that, oh, I'll just start this, this, and this, and then you can't really get any of them going because you're trying to run too many at one time. Or maybe you've started multiple art businesses at the same time thinking you could run a t-shirt shop and a sticker shop at the same time. Have you given yourself enough time to grow? I mean, after all, apples do not grow in one week. They don't grow in one month and they don't grow in one year. In fact, they take over three years to grow. And if you want a really good crop, at least four or five or six years. Do you take on projects bigger than your skill set or your capabilities? And you tell people, yeah, yeah, I can paint a wall mural on the top of that building, but you have no ladders. You've never seen what type of paint to use, which will, which ones will endure through all generations, through all the weather conditions. Um, how you would get a projector to project over there when there's no electricity in sight and all those kind of factors. I'm not saying not to dream. In fact, in fact, this channel is called Pocket Dreams and I completely believe in dreams, but I just want to say, do you have any dose of reality in your art world? Have you ever stopped to take assessment of the risks that are involved and find out whether you have enough knowledge to start it at that moment in time? Are you a little bit too grandiose in your ideas? Under impulsivity, do you think your art needs to look like everybody else's, thus you keep changing your art style to match what other people are doing? I mean, Austin Kleon has a book called Steal Like an Artist, and his premise is that we artists actually are creating art based upon all the visual stimulus that we have seen in our life, and those things come into being in our art. And it is a good idea to copy masterpieces because that's how you actually learn how to do the techniques that different um, artists are great at. But if all we're doing is copying, then you're not doing yourself or the world a service, and we can all tell also. But if you're changing your art constantly to match others, you need to actually look at what other people are doing and a great way to do this is to make a Pinterest board and go ahead and pin up a bunch of artworks that you like and then get a journal out and look at each individual piece of art and figure out what is it exactly that you like about that piece of art. Is it the composition, the way the objects are arranged on the canvas? Is it the line work or lack of line work? Is it the color palette? Is it the way the light shines in from one direction or multiple directions? Is it the contrast between lights and darks? Is it um, the stylistic textures that they've added or not added? Does it look smooth? Does it look um, rough and sketchy? 
just try to figure out exactly what it is that you like about that picture. Maybe it's the emotion that you feel when gazing at it or the story behind it or the questions that it leaves you. When you start writing down a list of all these things, it helps you figure out who exactly you are and what type of art you would like to create. Maybe you do like fuzzy lines. Maybe you do like soft muted colors and you like dramatic lighting or something. And over time, you can create a rule book of those things that you actually like and want to incorporate into your art. Another thing under impulsivity is do you second guess your gut reactions? Whenever you're creating art, do you constantly erase things or think that you need to um, like paint over it? Sometimes the first thing that you painted is actually your best. How many of you have ever done a picture twice or three times and you realize you like the first one best? You don't need to always do it a third time or a second time. Just go with your gut. Under hyperactivity, do you flip from project to project? I think all of us are guilty of that, right? Or am I the only one? I hope not. <laughs> do you spend too much time scrolling on social media instead of actually creating? Do you sit there and look at what all the trends are and never get around to creating your own art? And do you change your mind and do you change your mind frequently about what you want to do? I am so guilty of this because I literally get so enthusiastic and so excited that I really want to do everything. I really want to be a children's book illustrator. I really, really, really do. I also want to be a greeting card person. I also want to make service patterns. I want to do it all. Have you ever sat down and written out clear art goals? What exactly are you wanting to achieve? Do you want to increase your skills? Is art a hobby for you? Are you actually trying to make money from it? Do you know who your art audience is? Have you ever stopped to figure out um, if you're trying to get your art out into the world, who would be the best fit for your art? Are you trying to market your art to somebody who's so not interested because there's no alignment there? Another thing under the category of hyperactivity is, are you acting without thinking? This, this is also impulsivity. Do you have no sense of budget? Are you buying tons and tons of art supplies and not really considering the long haul of your art goal, what you're aiming towards, whether this will help you along that path? I have a really embarrassing story. Earlier this year, at the very beginning of the year, I was certain I was going to be a fine art oil painter and I was going to create small miniature oil paintings framed in frames that I made myself and gilded myself. And to do this, I did not think, I acted impulsively, and I purchased over $500 to $600 worth of art supplies in order to do this. I ordered red bowl and yellow clay bowl from France. Bowl is basically mud from the earth, the pigments from the earth. I ordered plasters, I ordered rabbit skin glues, I ordered all kinds of things in order to create these wonderful little masterpieces using techniques from the medieval and renaissance time periods, I actually ordered a book that has, I actually ordered a book that has recipes from back in the medieval times and renaissance times. I tried out some of those recipes and they didn't always work. I also found one online and I made my own gesso and I made my own um, ornaments. But on projects like this, sometimes you actually need to follow along with somebody who's done it before you, especially if you're trying to replicate the historical accuracy of how it was done back in the old days. So that was an instance of I had low risk assessment and I just dove in and grabbed all these supplies and now they're sitting there taking up a lot of my attic. I still want to finish those frames and I have every intent and purpose of painting pictures to go in those and I am going to gild those frames because I think they'll be beautiful, but I've moved on. Another time, I also bought every color in embroidery floss, probably that there is, not really, but it seems like it, and I was sure that I was going to make all kinds of embroidery and sell it. That didn't happen. That lasted one school year. I basically embroidered while my son was doing after school activities, and after that, that was the end of it. I loved it, and I'm so glad it's part of my art journey, I think all of these trials and experiences are great and they help build you into who you are. So I said all these things about art ADHD, a little bit tongue in cheek, but a little bit out of truth because I think it's a real thing. I think that sometimes we artists get so excited and get so enthusiastic that we do flip from thing to thing. And I think that we actually don't sit on something long enough for it to take traction and something to happen for it. It has been said that the people who are successful in their art businesses 
is simply because they didn't drop out of the race. In fact, so many people drop out that the ones that are the winners are, that are not actually the ones that have the most talent. They're just the ones who stayed in the race. So I want to encourage you to stay in the race and keep going. And if you're doing art as a hobby, that's great too. Just keep making art because we create art because it's fun, because it's enjoyable. Now let's talk about FOMO, fear of missing out. I think fear of missing out has a huge part to play in we artists because of social media. I mean, we can get on there and find all the new trends and see all the beautiful art that everybody else is making and it can cause us to freeze a little bit and not be able to create our own art. We get so inundated and we um, think our art has to be like that in order to work or to be successful and it sometimes hinders us being able to create our own personal style and have the courage to just be ourselves. You need to be uniquely you, I need to be uniquely me. I mean, there's only one of you. Remember the quote, the art quote? It says, be yourself, everyone else is taken. That's by Oscar Wilde. And it is so, so true. There will never be another person on this planet who is exactly like you, who has the same thoughts, who's been through the same experiences, who's had the same education, who's lived with the same family, who's lived in the same neighborhood of the same houses, who's traveled and had the same adventures. So you need to create the art that you want to see in the world. Get it out there so that we can all benefit from it. Now I'm going to tell you a little bit about my art journey. About six years ago, I jumped back into the art world when I realized that my children were old enough and that I had a little bit of time that I could spend on art. As a kid, I had always wanted to be a children's book author and illustrator. So I signed up for an illustrating children's book course. The last time I had really created any major art had been in college many, many years ago. So when I signed up and I found myself in a class of over a thousand people, I was amazed at the level and the skill of what these artists were creating. And I wanted to create art just as good. When I was in college, I was known for creating top art in my class with the interior design renderings. And I loved that art, but that was all traditional media. And most of the people in the class were creating digital art. So I decided right then and there, I was going to learn digital art. And I, I was so excited that I actually was able to produce art digitally. During the class, the takeaways were that I was in an art community for the first time since being in college. I love being surrounded by creative people and where I live here, and literally I know like one or two people that are creative. In fact, since I've lived here, I've never sat and done art with anyone. Isn't that sad? So I think that online art classes are a great way to find an art community. The other takeaway from doing that online art class was that it was the first time that I had done a creative brief, that I had to cre create artwork and turn it in on a deadline and it had to look a certain way and be up to a certain level of um, finished, that it had to be a finished product. I, I didn't expect to be so nervous. I was so nervous and I shouldn't have been because the only person I really needed to please was myself. It wasn't like a teacher was going to sit there and give me a grade for it but I sweated, I was so nervous because I really cared about it. I really wanted my art to be at a certain level. Another takeaway from taking that online art class was it was the first time in many, many years that I had called myself an artist. I decided that yes, I could call myself an artist because I love art and I was creating art. And you can call yourself an artist too. If you're waiting for something like somebody to pay you for your art or for somebody else to give you validation, you don't need to wait. You can call yourself an artist if you actually are creating art and you're doing it over a period of time. Yes, you are an artist. So after the course was over, I wrote and illustrated my first children's book. I was so excited. It is titled Eyes Wide Open, The Incredible Journey of Madame Lucy or something like that. It's available for purchase on my website as well as on Amazon. And I was going to submit it to um, publishers and I wanted to eventually eventually submit to publishers, but George Floyd happened, and it wasn't a time for such a book. So after I wrote my children's book, I went ahead and started drawing recipes and doing a few things for they draw and travel, they draw and cook, they draw and garden. I drew a map of Marie Antoinette's Paris that went along with the book that I had just illustrated, and to my surprise, it won. I was one of four people who won a $2,000 prize, and it was an amazing um, experience for me because it was kind of like a validation for what I was about to do. You see, I had wanted to start my art business and I had already been going through the motions of setting up for that, getting a website ready, and when that happened, I was like, yes, I think I'm on the right pathway. So I went ahead and got my art business license and I set up a website and I was open for commissions. Commissions is an entirely different thing for you art illustrators because you are creating something for somebody else. And often when people come to you, they have a certain idea in mind 
and they might have a different type of style and aesthetic as you. And sometimes you're just not a good fit. So I had to learn how to say no. Yes, of course you say yes to those things that you know are just gonna be amazing, but there are sometimes those clients that you have to say, um, I think I can recommend somebody else that would be a better fit. And don't be afraid to say no. After that, I took some more art classes so that I could further my skills and I took a boot camp. In the boot camp, I made a book cover, I did a project on tea, I did one on women's voting rights. I learned that I didn't particularly want to do too many political things. Um, I did a sewing tray, I did a hotel postcard, and a graphic no novel page. After that, I took a faces class. I had always been scared to draw people, so I dabbled in that. And then I took a home decor class A and a home decor class B. That was an amazing experience because I was very unaware of the top 10 art markets that use illustration work. So this was so exciting for me to see all the ways that art can be used in um, the home and in commercial uses. Um, we worked on bolt fabric, I did a 1950s collection, we worked on a children's book cover, we did some gift markets, some ceramics, Staffordshire, I really like how these turned out. We did wall art, I was floundering here, I'm not even going to show you the picture. We did a bonus project of a cookie tin. In home decor B, we worked on baby apparel, stationery. I made a deer cookie and at a time I did not know how to convert my file from CMYK to RGB so that it would appear on the website as the true colors. And so here you see it looking very bright. That's not actually how it's supposed to look. And I did a project on scrapbooking. I really enjoyed this because it was all, the theme was cruise ship and I went vintage and I love vintage. We worked on editorial. I did another map, a map of Würzburg, the town that my husband is from in Germany. I put it on a tea towel. And then I, we worked on party paper. I did a cup plate napkin, found that I really enjoy folk art. And we did a bonus project, t-shirts for kids, which I also enjoyed that. So the results of taking this class is I learned what the top 10 art markets were and I also explored so many new things, new to me, um, and worked on briefs. And I found that taking these classes was amazing because you were surrounded by so many artists making so many amazing things and there was so much inspiration there. I also learned that there's room for everyone. There are so many different art styles out there and all of them are valid. There is room for you. You need to be uniquely you and do the type of art that you want to see in the world. After that, I did some greeting card design and I had my cards professionally printed. I enjoyed this thoroughly and I'm still quite interested in greeting cards. And after this, I made a bunch of art prints and set them up on my website to sell digital art prints. And after that, I uploaded to Society6, Redbubble, Printful, um, and then I got into sticker design and then mug design because I'd heard the phrase that your art needs to solve a problem. And I thought, well, everybody needs a mug to put their coffee or their tea in in the morning, so I'll design some mugs. And if you're asking yourself that same question, what problem does art solve? Art solves a lot of problems and actually the biggest one is that we need beauty in this world. I mean, look outside the window. If this world was one single color like black and white and shades of gray, it would not be so inspirational. We probably wouldn't want to get out of bed in the morning. So, so for that reason only, art is extremely valid and necessary in life. So don't let anybody tell you otherwise. Art also inspires us. It motivates us to do things. It also can contain a message that it also can activate us to go help and encourage other people. It brings peace and calm. It can also bring happiness. So art does a lot of things in this world. I also got into a phase that I wanted to be a photographer and I wanted to do flat lays. I enjoyed that immensely. And then I got into faith art. I, I even set up a parallel business called Seedlets and I made an entire giant collection of printable Bible characters for kids in a theater format that they could print out like paper dolls. I had over 150 characters and over 400 or 450 props. And the idea was that kids could learn the Bible story retell the Bible story in their own words and also draw their own props so that they would be learning, talking, and being creative all at the same time. I also printed them out onto smooth flower fabric and I sewed hundreds of them. I ended up giving some to some at school and to some missionaries to use out on the field. And so that was a really fun experience and I still have them up for sale on my website today as well as on my smooth as well as in my smooth flower shop for those who like to sew. So a result of that was I found that I really liked marrying my faith with my art and I liked the message that it contained. And I also realized that I didn't know how to do marketing. So every meandering on my art journey has taught me something. After that, I got into posters, t-shirt design. I also did embroidery. 
and I got into journaling and sketchbooking, starting yet another side business with journaling. And then I decided, no, I didn't want to monetize that. It's just something that I enjoy doing and sketchbooking. And I don't do it all the time. It's just something that's a way for me to experiment and to have fun where it doesn't have to be a finished piece of art. So there's a lot more things that I did, but I'm not going to talk about them all here. And the latest was that I joined YouTube in the summer of this year. I've not been on YouTube very long, but I did it because I really want to connect with other artists. Where I'm at right now, I really am not surrounded by artist friends and I love seeing all those people online who like art and I've been through so many art experiences that I thought I just wanted to share them with you and connect with other people who love art as much as I do. And I hope that what I say is in a little tiny way helpful. So after saying all that and talking about art ADHD and FOMO, I wanted to say that I don't actually have ADHD in real life. I think it's kind of funny that a lot of those symptoms come into play in my art world. I'm kind of impulsive. I hop around from thing to thing. I change my mind. I have to try out everything. I'm kind of impulsive and I'm super excitable. But I want to say I can focus. I actually can get laser focused if I want to get something done and I do complete my projects. I didn't always complete projects way back in the day. These days I do complete projects. The one project that I haven't completed has been that frame and fine art painting gilding thing and I do intend to complete it someday. I just kind of came up with the idea of art ADHD because I wanted to know why I couldn't nail down my art niche and why I was having so much trouble doing it and it really helped me understand myself better and I'm hoping that it will help you understand yourself if you're doing the same thing that I'm doing. If you're literally trying out everything there is out there in the illustration world or in the art world um, before you stick to one thing and also you don't have to stick one thing. You are allowed to do multiple things. You are allowed to be multi-passionate. There is nothing wrong with enjoying a lot of things. In fact, there's so many artists whose artist studios who in their art studios offer a range of products and things that they like to create. And as far as FOMO, the fear of missing out, yeah, I actually really do have fear of missing out. I don't want to miss all the trends. There's a lot of cool trends out there and I kind of want to join in and do it too. I love everything that I see and I want to experience it all and I want to try everything out. I want to try all those art supplies. I also see success in what other people are doing and I think, Oh wow, I could try that. I could see myself doing that and I want to also be successful in that as well. All of this is good and fine as long as you are being uniquely you and that you are not copying other people. Be inspired by what you see, but put your own spin on it. Remember the Austin Kleon books that I mentioned? He says that artists basically steal. They see the art and they find something they like and they pull a little element of that and they put it into their own art. Just make sure you're not making your art that looks just like other people. In fact, be inspired and then close the books, turn off the internet and go and create the art so that you're not looking at those things right in front of you. You want to create something that really is expressing you everything about your life, all of those things and experiences, the um, childhood that you had, the things that you love today, the things that you don't love, put all that into your art because you are unique and we want to see what you have to create and offer the world. <clears throat> um, so, so you artists like me who haven't yet found your art niche and you keep pivoting and you keep changing your mind or you keep adding more to it. I want to let you know about some corporations and some people who have done just that. It takes time to figure out what it is that you want to do. And did you know that Starbucks began as a person selling coffee beans and espresso machines? And then it was purchased by a man who thought he could take it to a different level and create a coffee house that people would like to come to in the community, kind of a central hub. And look at where Starbucks is today. Nintendo used to make Japanese playing cards. I know because I bought a set of those for my son a while back. Vintage set. Pinterest used to be called something called Tote that would alert online shoppers that their product was on sale that they wanted to buy. Apple used to sell their computers as DIY kits. Do-it-yourself computers? Are you kidding? Colonel Sanders of KFC Kentucky Fried Chicken used to be a gas station attendant and then he was also an attorney, he was also an insurance salesman and other types of salesmen. He tried over a thousand times to sell his fried chicken recipe and nobody wanted it. And now we all love Kentucky Fried Chicken. Walt Disney was fired from his newspaper job because they said he wasn't creative enough. And his first animation studio, it shut down after two years and went bankrupt. He didn't give up. 
Ray Kroc used to sell milkshake machines until he one day decided to buy a local burger joint and he turned that into the largest fast food franchise in the world known as McDonald's. Julia Child, a gangly, tall uh, American who loved French food, she used to work for the OSS, the Office of Strategic Services, which is the forerunner to the CIA, and she was working on creating shark repellent. Before, at age 50, she created her first cookbook. It was huge, it was like over 800 pages, and she became famous and did a TV series. Sarah Blakely sold office supplies door to door before she ended up marketing her new form of um, feminine um, underwear, shapewear called Spanx. We've all heard of Vera Wang, who was a famous figure skater who turned journalist, who turned fashion designer, and we can buy her clothes at our local Kohl's and other department stores. So don't let anybody tell you that you can't pivot or that you have to stick with one thing right now when you haven't figured out what it is. Keep going, keep doing what you love, never, never give up, and create the art that you want to see in the world. All of us are on an art journey of our own, and each one of our and each one of our journeys looks a little bit differently. Be yourself, everyone else is already taken. Be patient, good things take time to create and to grow. Know your why, why do you like to create? What is it that you are trying to produce? Is it an emotion, is it a feeling? Are you trying to solve a problem with your art? Are you creating a certain product because you've always wanted that whenever you were younger or now? Figure out why you create and that will be a secret and the key to where you're headed in the future with your art. And if you need to pay your bills, be honest with yourself. Are you where you need to be right now in order to produce that money? And if you're not, don't give up on your dreams. Just get a day job if you need to and keep working on it until you get to the point where you can make a full-time living from your art. And the other thing is enjoy the journey. Enjoy where you're at. So there's one more thing that I want to mention that I think that will really help you. Recently, I was taking my son to college in Japan, and on the way back, I was in the airplane flying halfway between Japan and America, and they had Skillshare classes. I watched one by Andy J. Pizza. A lot of you know his podcast, The Creative Podcast. It's, he's incredible. I love listening to him. So he did a deep dive into figuring out your personal art style, and he divided into four categories of research. The first one is your identity. The second one is your sense of taste. The third one was your experiments. And the fourth is your experiences. And under identity, he said that you are basically a little bit of your mother and a little bit of your father. There are things that you can't change, things that you grew up with, and a lot of that comes into your art. And it may be things that you actually run from, like maybe your art is representation of what you didn't like as a child or maybe as things that you love but that is your identity the second is your sense of taste and we all have there are all things that we like in art some of us love explosions of color some of us like um, moodiness some of us like the interplay of lights and darks and contrasts other of us are really into composition or minimalism or whatnot so your sense of taste and style is going to be heavily influencing how you create your art the third category was experimental, and those are all the um, times that you let yourself play when creating art, and a lot of us forget to do this. So you need to make sure that you allow yourself a place to make mistakes, because those mistakes can become happy accidents that actually you make something and you're like, oh man, I really like the way that ink blot turned into something else, or I really like that I use these waxy crayons that I never use, and I like the line work that they create. They're very different than anything I've ever done, and I think I'm going to incorporate that into my art. So make sure that you allow yourself those experiments. And the fourth category was your experiences. Every single one of us has a lifetime of experiences. We can call that our baggage, the good and the bad. All together, it is the um, where we are raised, the town we are raised, and the education that we receive, the type of friends that we've had, the type of friends our parents have had, the jobs that we have had. Um, the animals that we've had, the type of scenery we've seen outside of our window, the travels and adventures that we've been able to take, all of that comes into play. And so Andy J. Pizza um, suggests doing deep dive into all these categories, writing them out, and then over time as you create your work, your artwork, you will be able to figure out what it is that is your style and he even has you like write down those little things and they can become your rules of style. I found this was the best explanation and I can't recommend watching this high enough. It is so good. I currently don't have a Skillshare um, subscription but I have many times in the past and this is the first time I've ever seen this and it was 
kind of confirming to me because for years I have kept books like this. There's another one up on my shelf over there that I basically write down all those types of things, literally, but I had never thought to organize it like he did and write it down as to those four categories. But I've been doing that for quite a few years with all the ideas of what I love, what I hate. I even have a style journal that is literally divided up into categories of the type of line I like, the type of natural materials I like, like I like sheepskins and I like wood grain and things like that. So the more you understand who you are, the closer you are to figuring out what type of art you like to create and what your art business niche is or just your art niche, what you want to create. So. Enjoy the process and go and make some art today. Thanks for watching, it means so much to me. I hope that this is helpful and I'm so excited to share this with you. I just love talking about art. Bye.